Good morning, church. I hope that you are doing great this morning. I hope you're doing well, that you're having a good Lord's Day, that you're having a good Easter. This is my third time trying to record this video, and I am hoping that it goes well. I've had a error upon error, uh, but I think I've got the sound fixed. I think I've got everything straightened up for you guys, and I hope that it goes through this is just one more reason why I am very much looking forward to being with you together again. I am pray and hope that it can be soon. Um, you know, I've never had an issue of uh, waiting till the end of Bible class to realize that I wasn't recording when I was in person. Um, but I am glad to be with you together. I'm looking forward to our chances to be together to sing, to pray together, for you guys to ask questions so that I'm not just staring, you know, at a uh, at a screen and anticipating some questions and try to answer some things. It kind of takes the fun out of Bible class in a lot of ways for me. But we are going to be picking up where we left off here in the book of 2 Kings, where we've been teaching this class that, that I've entitled, No King Like David. And the reason that we've in, uh, described it this way is because every king that we've seen has been compared in some ways to David. Are they doing what David does or are they not? And each time they inevitably fail, regardless of their promise, regardless of how what few things they do well. And the writers of the book of Kings, writing during the exile, when the Israelites are in captivity and longing for freedom and longing for redemption, and looking back at their history, they realize that it's not just that they need another David. They need a king who is greater than David, if they're going to have a hope of surviving these trials. And so we're going to see this morning in 2 Kings chapter 13, uh, focus on a few kings from the northern kingdom, particularly Jehoahaz and um, uh, Joash, to see what these situations are like, to, to get a little bit more of an idea of what some of these other kings who are from the north are doing in their lives. So if you want to turn over your Bibles there, that's where we're going to be picking up in uh, uh, 2 Kings chapter 13. And we're going to be looking first at Jehoahaz. Now to do that, we're going to, I'm going to see if we can get this, I think we've got it to work. We're going to be reading through the scriptures together. Now in the 23rd year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, the king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, began to rule over Israel and Samaria. And he ruled 17 years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He did not depart from them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them continually into the hand of Hazael, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael. Then Jehoahaz sought the favor of the Lord, and the Lord listened to him. For he saw the oppression of Israel, how the king of Syria oppressed him. Therefore the Lord gave Israel a savior, so that they escaped from the hand of the Syrians, and the people of Israel lived in their homes as before. Nevertheless, they did not depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin, but walked in them. And the Asherah also remained in Samaria. Now I'm going to scroll down here for the last few verses. For there was not left to Jehoahaz an army of more than 50 horsemen and 10 chariots and 10,000 footmen. For the king of Syria had destroyed them and made them like dust at threshing. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoahaz and all that he did and all of his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Jehoahaz slept with his fathers and they buried him in Samaria. And Joash his son reigned in his place. So, so what we have here in this situation is we are introduced to uh, new kings, a uh, new king there in Israel, and this king is Jehoahaz. Now Jehoahaz, we're going to see, is the descendant of, or should I say the son of Jehu. So Jehu, of course, had been the, the new king in the north who's destroyed the Ahabites and the, the sons of the Amorites. Am and we read that he, Jehoahaz, comes into power in the 23rd year of Joash of Judah. Now, Joash of Judah has a very long reign. He reigns 40 years. And his reign looms kind of large over the reigns of the shorter-lived and shorter-reigned kings of the north. And he rules for 17 years. Um, it's uh, give or take 814 to 798 B.C. 
And less important than how long he reigns or when he reigns is the fact that he does evil in the eyes of the Lord. He continues in the sins of Jeroboam, the first king of the north. That he continues to worship the golden calves. He does not depart from their power and their prestige and the things that he thinks that they give their empire. And, and because of his sins, we read that God gives him into the hands of Syria, into the hands of Hazael. Now, Syria has been the favorite tool that God has, has had against Israel for a long time. That Syria has, of course, been the tool that God's used against Ahab and Ahab's family, and now against Jehu and Jehu's family. And here, where we're pl- I'm playing, is about the height of Syrian power, um, at least until the Assyrians come in to destroy them. And God gives them continually into the hand of Hazael and then Ben-Hadad, his son. But then we read something really surprising. Did you note this when you were reading through the text together with, uh, with us? That he sought the Lord. He sought the Lord. Now this is pretty interesting because generally speaking, we don't see this for northern kings. Now every so often we'll get a southern king who will seek the Lord. But for the north, for them to seek the Lord, that is so surprising. That here, this king, even though he comes from Jehu's line, and even though they are doing all these different things, that he recognizes something about his life. He recognizes something about their power. He recognizes something about Israel's situation, and he seeks the Lord. And and, and God, because of that, they raise up a savior for Israel. Now, we don't know exactly who this savior is. Um, The text doesn't tell us. There, are, you know, this has of course been one of those really interesting things that, that people have tried to figure out. And uh, even though we don't know for sure, there's been some guesses that have been made. You know, some people say, "Oh, well, it must be the king himself is the savior." And that's that's possible. Other people said, "No, I think it's the Assyrian king, Adad-Nirari II." Now, Adad-Nirari II is a, an Assyrian king who invades Syria and kind of beats them up in 805, about 10 years after Jehoahaz begins to reign. And that kind of lessens the pressure on Israel. And that makes sense in a lot of ways because we do know that God does use the Syrians to punish Israel, to punish uh, Judah during the time of Hezekiah, to, to punish Syria. So that kind of makes some sense. But I think that I think that if we were going to be paying really close attention, another example actually makes better sense. I think it's talking about Elisha the prophet. And the reason I say that is we have a few kind of uh, echoes of the Exodus here. That, uh, that chapter 13, verses 4 through 5, when it talks about God hearing Israel's oppression and raising them up a Savior, it sounds a lot like Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 5 through 9, which speaks of Moses' work as God's agent of deliverance. And we've talked about in, before in previous classes that Elisha is very much like a new Moses. Uh, there's another text that we're going to get to in a little bit later in the time of Joash that I think makes it pretty a pretty strong case, but of course we can't be certain for, for certain. But I do think that, that what we see here is we also are given the reason for why. That we know when we read these texts why and what drove Israel to seek a Savior. And that is that they needed divine intervention and they recognized that they needed divine intervention and they needed it badly because they were so militarily and politically weak. Did you, did you catch the description of how weak their army was? That Jehoahaz's once powerful army now has no more than 50 horsemen and 10 chariots and 10,000 soldiers. Now, the 10,000 soldiers, these are all footmen. These are probably not professional armsmen. These are probably levies or draftees that they could call up that aren't very powerful. But the, it's the, the professional military is the horsemen and the chariots. And back in the time of Ahab, Ahab had 10,000 thousand chariots. And here Jehoahaz only has ten. They have been brought so low that even Israel, even Jehoahaz, have to recognize they need God. And God has brought them so low, kind of like what he's done with Gideon, so they have to realize and recognize that God is the one who has saved them. But you notice what happens, that even though God saves them, even though God saves them from the hand of the Syrians, even though he gives them victory, and they understand, of course, who it's from, they never abandon the golden calves. They don't abandon their idols. They don't change their behavior. 
They're not willing to go all the way. And so Jehoaz's end is his wickedness. That he dies, he's buried in the tomb of Samaria, and his son Joash, not to be confused with the Joash of the south, uh, who we'll see again in a second, but he reigns in his place. This is representative, I think, overall of what we've seen for the northern kingdom. And that is that even when they serve God, they're not willing to serve God completely. They're not willing to do what the prophet says completely. We're going to see that this text and this idea comes back at the end of where we're, 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 we're going to be reading today. And so when we, we are brought and, 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 and kind of brought to face with the new king of Israel, to Jehoash, the, the son of Jehoahaz, that we're going to see the same thing is going to play out here as well. So we're going to read that text then, um, verses 10 through 13. I invite you to read along with me here. Now, in the 37th year of Joash, the king of Judah... Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, began to reign over Israel and Samaria. And he reigned 16 years, and he also did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. But he walked in them. Now the rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did, and the might with which he fought against Amaziah, the king of Judah, aren't they written in the books of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Joash slept with his fathers, and Jeroboam sat on the throne. And Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. So we have then only these few verses to discuss what is going on with Joash. Now this Joash is not the Joash of Judah. He is Joash the son of Jehoahaz. And as we mentioned, um, I think two classes ago, the difference between whether it's Joash or Jehoash um, it's spelled both ways in our English Bibles, and the reason for that is is probably because of a difference in how, uh, not to get too technical, but how um, the O is written in northern Israel versus in Judah. There's a difference in dialect in how they write those long vowel letters. If you're really interested, uh, give me a text or something, and I'll happy to explain the whole thing. It's just, a, it's just a difference in the text depending on what records our inspired writer and editor is using. So Jehoash and Joash are the same, but these two Joashes and Joazes are not the same. One is in the north, one is in the south. It's really confusing, but after this it's going to get a little bit better. We won't keep running into these issues um, after the Jehoash is here. It is kind of interesting that we read that he is the son of Jehoash and he comes to reign during the 37th year of Joash of Judah. So Joash of Judah is still king. And he's going to rule for 16 years, give or take 798 B.C. through 782 B.C. Now, one thing if you're paying really, really close attention you might have noticed and have a question about is that in 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 1, or 14, verse 1, we read that Joash came to the throne during the 39th year of Jehoash instead of the 37th. Uh, there are a few possible answers to this. Um, I, I don't think it's really a big deal. The, the first, of course, and I think probably uh, the easiest answer, is that it's just a scribe has made a mistake. Um, that happens when you copy down things a lot, especially with numbers. Uh, the Greek translation, for example, has 39 years in both cases, so that maybe the Hebrew uh, scribe made a mistake. Another possibility that someone has brought up is maybe it was a co-regency. That's probably a little less likely. But maybe, maybe the most likely possibility is actually that we see there is a shift in how the dating occurs between the kings of the north and, um, and even the kings of the south at this point. So, the Assyrians have come to the throne, um, come to power, and they're kind of so powerful that everybody's kind of doing the same things that they do. And they count the first year of a king as year one as opposed to year zero. So it's kind of like when you have a baby, you know, the McClisters, for example, have a, another grandchild, which is pretty exciting for them. Um, and exciting that they, they're having such a quiver full of their own grandchildren now. Um, is that when you have, you know, you ask how old the kid is, well, they're not one yet, right? You know, you use weeks or you use months or something else like that, but they don't, they don't do that for reigns. So sometimes you count the year zero as year one and other times you don't. So that is perhaps more likely what, what we're dealing with here, although of course we, we can't know for sure. 
But what we do know, and what the focus of the text is, is is not on his when he came to the throne, or that specifics of the dating and where they fall there with the south, but it's instead the focus on the fact that he does evil. It's unsurprising. Everybody else in the north has done evil. Everybody else is a calf worshiper. Everybody else follows the idols of Dan and Bethel. And so we have this very short description of his life, his rule, and his death. We have a few little snippets included, right? He fought, fights a war with Amaziah, the king of Judah. We actually, that becomes a major focus of the text in chapter 14, but we're not going to get there yet, which is told from Amaziah on Judah's side. But he dies and he sleeps with his fathers and his son, who's the fourth generation from Jehu, Jeroboam the second, is going to take the throne and he's buried in Samaria. And we think, well, that's not very much information about Joash. Why, why, did you title, why did you title this class Joash when we get four verses here, verses 10, 11, 12, and 13? Well, it's because even though he dies and it wraps up that part of the story, there's another part of the story that is really important. In fact, is the, the most important part of the entire um, thing that we're discussing in today's lecture, I think. Uh, in today's uh, Bible class, and that is we're going to realize that this is going to bring him back into connection with the the leading character that's spread throughout this section that's more important than any of the kings, and that is the prophet Elijah. And so Elisha now is going to have a story of what's going on between him and Joash. So let's go ahead and we're going to read that text now, this is in 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 14 through 19. Now, when Elisha had fallen sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash, king of Israel, went down to him and wept before him, crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But Elisha said to him, Take a bow and arrows. So he took a bow and arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, Draw the bow. And he drew it. And Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. And Elisha said, shoot, and he shot. And he said, the Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Syria, for you shall fight the Syrians in Aphek until you've made an end of them. And he said, take the arrows, and he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground with them. And he struck three times and stopped. Then the man of God was angry with him, and he said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck down Syria until you made an end of it. But, but now you'll strike down Syria only three times. And here we have one of these really fascinating sorts of situations that's going on, these really interesting changes, because there's a lot going on here in this interaction between Elisha and Joash. You know, um, Joash is, in many ways, right, an idolater. He is worshiping the golden calves. He has not taken seriously Elisha's commands. He's, he's not gotten rid of the Asherah. We know he does evil. But... He still recognizes how important Elisha is. And so here, when Elisha is at his deathbed, he comes and he speaks respectfully to him. He calls him uh, father, my father, showing that he's more important than he is. He knows and recognizes how important Elisha is. And, and you've got to imagine, considering Elisha's interaction with the kings, where he has saved Israel from, from uh, destruction by the Syrians so many times, He's got to wonder, what's going to happen after Elisha's gone? He calls them the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And your ears should kind of be tingling because that is exactly the thing that Elisha called Elijah back in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 12, when Elijah is about to leave in the chariot of fire. And here, I think, is that explanation where we, where we can understand who the Savior that comes to save Israel during the time of this invasion is. Because remember, the king of Israel doesn't have any more than 10 chariots and 50 horsemen. How is he able to gain a, a military victory over Syria with only 10 chariots and 50 horsemen? It's because Elisha is the real chariots and horsemen of Israel. And he commands him to do two things. The first, of course, he tells him to shoot an arrow out the window. It's a symbolic act, just like Elisha so often does, that he has uh, done these sorts of things, right? He tells him to grab a bow, he grabs a bow, tells him to grab an arrow, he grabs an arrow, he says to open up the window, he opens up the window, he shoots the arrow out, and he tells him, this is a representative of a victory over Syria. You're going to win a major battle at the Battle of Afek. 
And then he tells him to do something strange. He tells him to strike the ground. And at first it seems like Joash falls his command. He strikes the ground three times. He's going to win three victories over Syria. But Elisha is angry. He says, you should have continued to do what I told you to do. Keep on doing this until I told you to stop. And at first, we might be kind of confused about what's going on there. But I think it'll make a whole lot more sense if we go back to the text and look a little bit more closely about how this plays out. And and notice, I'm going to try to highlight the situation so we can see what's going on. So Elisha tells him, take a bow and the arrows. And notice what Joash does. He takes the bow and the arrows. Then Elisha says, draw the bow. And he drew the bow. And he says, open the window. And he opened the window. And Elisha says, shoot. And he shot. And he says, take the arrows. Right? And so he takes the arrows. And then he says, strike the ground. And here's where we run into the issue. He struck three times and stopped. He struck the ground three times and he stopped. And at first it seems like he's followed his command, but when you look at it a little bit more closely, you realize that he hasn't at all. Then when you look, hopefully what we did, and hopefully it shows up on your screen as well, when he does exactly what Elisha says, exactly what Elisha says, exactly what Elisha says, over and over and over, until he doesn't. And here we have the problem. You know, the other things seem to make sense to him. You know, open up a window, sure, he's sick, he needs some air. Okay, grab a bow and arrow, fine, you know, some symbolic action. Shoot the arrow, okay, that's what you do. But you know what you don't do? You know what doesn't make sense to him? You don't use arrows to pound the ground. And here we have a representation of exactly all the problems and all the issues that have been true of all of the kings of the north. He's willing to follow God's commands up to a point. But he's not willing to go all the way. You know, this has been the problem the whole time. Remember, God raises up a king. He, he raised up Jehu, he anointed Jehu, and he says, Jehu, listen, if you do everything I tell you to do, if you follow me exactly, then I will make you like David. I will establish a dynasty for you that will last forever. And Jehu starts out well. He, he, he destroys the Baals. He destroys Baal worship in Israel. But he stops. He doesn't, he doesn't destroy the golden calves. He won't get rid of them. And this is the same problem that we run into here with Jehoahaz, that right, he prays to God, he turns to God, he seeks out the Lord, but he won't get rid of the golden calves. And here Joash too, that he seeks out Elijah, he'll shoot an arrow, he'll strike the ground three times, but he won't keep doing it. He's not willing to follow God all the way. He's not going to get rid of his golden calves. He's not willing to do everything that God says. He, whether it doesn't make sense to him or whether he got tired of doing it or whatever the reason that he says, listen, I'm not going to follow God's commands all the way. And because of that, Jehu or Joash, they don't get complete victory. They get blessings, but not as much as God wants to give them. Jehu's dynasty is going to last the longest of any dynasty in the north, but it will not last forever. And Joash will gain three victories over the Syrians but he will not destroy them completely. And I think we have to ask to some degree about our own lives here, our own situations. Are we like Joash and Jehu, where we'll follow God up to a point, up to where it's convenient for us, up to where it makes sense to us, but we're not going to go beyond that point. We're not going to keep on following God forever. We're not going to really put ourselves out over it, that there's, we'll go this far, And no further, no matter what God has said. And that's pretty tragic. That that Elisha's last act is actually condemnation of Joash. Because Joash will not follow God. Now, in this situation, and if I was the people of Israel at this point, I'd be pretty bummed. You know, I would be fearful. I would wonder what hope we had. I mean, think, Elisha has died. 
And the people have got to wonder, who's going to step up next? Who's going to be the next Elisha? You know, when Elijah went away, he had a clearly defined kind of successor in place, right? He'd already given Elisha his his mantle. He'd picked up and was going to anoint Jehu of Israel and Hazael of Syria. And there was kind of a, a plan and a clear succession. But what is there now that Elisha leaves? There's nothing. And the people have got to wonder. They've got to wonder where is their hope? What, what success do they have? Because Elisha has left, but the, the kings of Israel are still wicked. And the golden calves are still being worshipped. What then is next? What hope do they have? And the answer to that is going to be explained in this next story. And this next story is going to tell the story about what happens to Elijah, sorry, Elisha, after he is dead. And it's going to answer the question, is God abandoned his people now that his servant, the prophet, now that his savior is, the gra- is in the grave? Has he abandoned Israel? So let's go ahead and read verses 20 through 21 here. So Elisha died and they buried him. Now bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year, and as a man was being buried, behold, a marauding band was seen, and the man was just thrown into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. Now this is an interesting, kind of a strange text, right? You know, to some degree, it it answers the the questions that we've seen about Elisha doing double the miracles of Elijah. You know, Elisha Elijah raises one person from the dead while he's alive. Elisha does too. But now that even though Elisha's dead, he raises a second body from the grave. But I I don't think that's really the, the main point of the story. I think the main point of the story is to answer that question. If God's Savior is lying in the grave, are God's promises gone? Do we have hope left? And this story explains that even though God's servant and his Savior lies in the grave, hope remains because God is faithful. Elijah has gone to heaven without dying, and Elisha has kept giving Israel life even after he dies. These, this, these guys who've come to bury the friend and have to skedaddle because they're attacked, they dump the body into the nearest tomb, and he comes out and revived and alive. That, that this is, gives them hope. And today of all days, right on Easter, we should recognize that this is absolutely something that looks forward to Jesus. Because yesterday, right, our king, our savior, God's prophet, Jesus, lay in a tomb. And the people wondered if God's promises could remain. You remember what the the disciples on the road to Emmaus who were talking to Jesus said? They said, you know, this person, we had hoped he was going to be the one to restore Israel. And And after he died, the the disciples or the the apostles are locked in an upper room. They wonder what hope there is. But God is faithful. God has not abandoned his people. God is still with Christ even when he was in the grave. that, That by his death, he has broken the bonds of death. That he proclaims victory over Satan. That he revives. And it's not just that his, as his body in the tomb, those of us who get thrown into the tomb are going to be revived. No, it's that... When he is in the tomb, he comes forth from the tomb and all the bodies, bodies come forth from tombs all over the place. And of course, at the end of days, when Christ comes again, then all of our bodies, all of us will be resurrected because we have hope in Christ that God's servant, our Savior, is dead, but he is not dead, that he is risen, that he is alive, and by his stripes we are healed. And this text coming then to the children of Israel as they live in bondage, it makes a lot of sense to them. It's, it's a comforting thing to them. And that also explains what's going to happen then in, in the next section of what's going on. In this last section that explains what Elijah's words are still powerful. Now, Hazael, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz. But the Lord was gracious to them and had compassion on them, and he turned towards them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not destroy them, nor has he cast them from his presence until now. 
But when Hazael, the king of Syria, died, Ben-Hadad, his son, became king in his place. Then Jehoahash, the son of Jehoahaz, took again from Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael, the cities that had been taken from Jehoahaz, his father, in war. Three times Joash defeated him and recovered the cities of Israel. This text is all about those promises that Elisha had made. Because Elisha's promises to Joash have come true. Hazael had been a powerful king and he had been empowered by God that he brings oppression and danger to Israel. But God is faithful and gracious and compassionate and he turns to them. And did you notice why he turns to them? Because of his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and to Jacob. And he doesn't cast them from his presence. And this text, I think, would have rung a little bit differently to the people living in exile. Because they had to wonder themselves, are we like Israel? Have we been so sinful that we've been cast off and God will not be faithful? God will not remember His covenant? And what does it say? That He has not cast them from His presence even now, until now. That if Elisha's promises are true for Israel, then they are true for Judah. And if they are true for Judah, there is hope for them And that hope, although it is not explicit anywhere in the Old Testament outside of Daniel, that hope is tied to what that previous thing, the thing that we saw in the grave of Elisha, and that hope is tied to resurrection. Now, nowhere outside of Daniel chapter 12 is there a a, a hope that is clear for a universal resurrection. But here we see a hint of it. Here we see that the people living in exile desire resurrection. They know they need something, a prophet like Moses, a king like David. And I think that all comes to the fore. It all comes to most obvious. It all shows how important that is in something that is going to be the last thing that we're going to talk about this morning. And that is, this all focuses on an image that I at least, um, and, and maybe you guys are too, very attenuated right now at this time of history in our, in our calendar, and that is, it seems to be focused on the Exodus. first one we see is right there that God says he sees the oppression of Israel. And this text about seeing the oppression of Israel, it reminds me of Exodus chapter 2 verses 23 through 25. Now I'm going to read that for you. It says, during those many days, knew that he sees their oppression. And do you remember what happens when God saw their oppression there in in 2 Kings chapter 13 verse 6? It says he raises up a savior so that they escape from the hands of the Syrians. And that text, that what we've seen playing out there, that reminds me of what we see in Deuteronomy chapter 26 verses 5 through 9. I actually mentioned this passage when we were going through it, but I didn't read it. I want to read it now.
with honey and here the oppressor uh, was Egypt and the savior was Moses and here in this text the oppressor is Syria and the savior is the new Moses Elisha and and notice there it talks about with great wonders and signs and a lot of times I think we can read our biblical texts and think that wonders and signs and miracles just happen all the time and that's actually not exactly true they're concentrated in three periods of history the first is at the period of the exodus the second is the workings of Elijah and Elisha. Do you know what the third is? We'll talk about that in one second. But the other thing that we want to focus the sins of Jeroboam, the, the, the golden calves that he sets up, right? And do you remember what the Israelites do when they come out of the land and Moses goes up on Mount Sinai and the people are down there with Aaron and they wonder how long, what do they, what do, they do? They build the golden calves, the sins of Jeroboam. But even though God could have and maybe should have destroyed the Israelites there for worshiping the golden calves, So the Israelites here are living, or the, the Jews at this point, living in exile in Babylon. They know they need a new exodus. They know that it's much like the people of Israel. That not that they are beyond the river in Egypt, but they are beyond the river in Babylon. That they need a new Moses to come and save them. They need freedom from bondage. They need freedom from oppression. They need God to remember his covenant. And in that, their entire hope lies. But, of course, the Passover is not just the Passover. And the Exodus is not just the Exodus. What is the second Exodus that they long for? In some ways, it is fulfilled in the return of Israel from Babylonian captivity. But do you remember what I said, that third period of when miracles in the Bible are concentrated in? is the time of Jesus. Because just as you would read in Isaiah or the rest of the prophets, they understood that the real second exodus was the coming of the Messiah. And here, I think we see how this story connects to what we're doing this morning. What we are thinking of today, that we are thinking of Easter, we are thinking of of Christ's death, burial, and his resurrection. And we recognize that what occurs in that death, burial, and resurrection is a new exodus. That, That God has saved us from bondage, not to a king in Egypt, not to a king in Babylon, but to the king of all these, the prince of all these kingdoms of Satan, uh, bondage to sin. And he does it by bringing us through water, not the waters of the Nile or the waters of the Euphrates, but of the waters of baptism. And that we too have to live now with God. And we cannot afford, like the Israelites in the wilderness, or like Joash, who only pounded the sand three times, or like Joah has, who although he is saved by God, he does not give up the golden calves. That we cannot afford to not sacrifice our golden calves as well. So as we go about our lives and as we seek to serve God in them, I hope that this is helpful. I hope that we remember this. I look forward to to seeing us all. This ended up being a little bit shorter um, than normal, probably because it's my third time recording it, and I and I really, really hope it actually records this time. I, I might pitch a hissy fit if it doesn't. But I look forward to seeing you guys again. I hope that your Lord's Day is good. I hope that your Easter is good. I hope that as you remember our Lord, that it changes your life. And that we can all put to death our golden calves. I look forward to seeing you in person soon.